Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Shelley Goldstein. I'm here in Florida. Uh, today's lecture is called Fascia. So thank you so much to the American Acupuncture Council for allowing me to be here today and presenting this topic to you. So let's go to the slides. One of the things that has become very um, obvious to me these days is the synergy of Eastern and Western medicine. And I do firmly believe that integrating Eastern and Western medicine in today's healthcare system is both a multifaceted effort. It's on both of our parts, Eastern and Western practitioners. It requires collaboration, education, research, and certainly cultural sensitivity. And when we are able to perform these responsibilities, uh, the potential is enormous for both patients, but also for us as well. For the patients, it provides a broader range of treatment options and more personalized care. And then when we as Eastern medicine practitioners begin to understand Western medical concepts, uh, we find that not only do the patients benefit, but we do as well, because recognizing and understanding these parallels of each of those systems can absolutely lead to an enhanced professional collaboration and improved patient care, which is so important today because as Eastern medicine practitioners, this is our time. This is our time to join Western medical practitioners in an integrative care modality to, to improve the quality of healthcare and to bring forward a much broader range of treatment options uh, for both the patients and the practitioners as well. That is what brings me to this topic of fascia. I am obsessed with fascia these days. Fascia is kind of the glue that's holding us all together. It's the, from a modern anatomical and physiological um, perspective, uh, we see it both as fascia from a Western medical perspective and in our world as Eastern medicine practitioners, we see it as the concept of Jing Jin or the sinew channels. And when we talk about Jing Jin, what we're talking about is the network of pathways related to both muscles, tendons, and all of the other connective tissue that keeps us connected in the body. What is fascia from a Western medical perspective? It's a form of connective tissue. It contains collagen fibers, elastin fibers, and what we call ground substance. And so ground substance is what keeps it all together, keeps it nice and moist. So you think about fascia is this tactile network of tissue that both uh, surrounds every muscle, organ, vessel, bone, and nerve fiber, but it also connects the horizontal planes from bone to the surface of the skin. So it surrounds and protects, but it also connects. And it's three-dimensional. As you can see in this image, it moves back and forth. It provides the structural integrity, the stability, and the flexibility of our body to move and be fluid in its movement. And it also allows us to move in a multi-directional and multi-dimensional plane uh, so that we, our fluids are, our movements are nice and fluid. Um, one muscle doesn't move and then another independently find the movement of another muscle so that there's this schism of muscle, muscle, muscle contraction, muscle contraction. But it's that fluid movement that allows us to move through the different multi-dimensional planes um, upward, downward, inside, outward, and then running through these planes of fascia are nerves. And in that sense, not only do we have movement, but we have sensation. There are so many nerve endings or nerves that run through the fascial planes that it is almost as sensitive as touch on the surface of our skin. That's how sensitive and acute our fascial system is. Uh, it is both affected by internal muscle activity and external, say, gravity and movement. And so as these systems come into play, both our muscle contractions and the weight of external bearing systems, uh, it allows that transmission and that dispersion 
of that through the net fascial network. And then also through its physioelastic properties, it helps to move us in one direction or another. So for example, if someone holds onto your arm and pulls, it's not just your arm muscle that's gonna pull, but your whole body is gonna move along with that, with that pull or with that movement to compensate both movement in one direction and stabilize that movement in, an, in another direction. And when we have our body moving in, the, in a nice fluid system, such as the fascial system, it actually helps to minimize the amount of energy that's utilized throughout, throughout each singular or connected movement. Fascia protects the integrity of the body and helps prevent or minimize local stress within a specific muscle joint or bone. So for example, if you have tightness in say one area, it, the, the ability for the fascial network to move and to break through that tightness uh, allows the body to minimize that local stress and also to absorb that localized stress and kind of move it through the body to release that, that tension or that stress. Think of it as the Terminator, right? Think of the Terminator revisited. Think of what if the Terminator was just an individual uh, subset of parts and, and there was this gap filler, this structure that was stayed in, 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 the, in those empty spaces and it just filled the space. That's not what fascia is. Fascia is actually what we've been talking about, that ability for this entire elastic contractile signaling, whole body signaling network to move the body in a very fluid dynamic uh, structure so we can run faster, jump higher, and be more efficient in our movements. There are multiple types of fascia. There's superficial fascia. That's what's on the surface of our body. And it's a very loose layer. It's very wet. And it uh, is made up of fat, adipose tissue, collagen, and elastin fibers. And that ground substance or hyaluronic acid keeps that superficial fascia nice and loose and sticky so that its job is to actually attach the superficial and horizontal planes so that you get this smooth flow between the different horizontal layers so that there's no friction or tension. Its job is more to stabilize and connect these structures, whereas deeper fascia is much more fibrous and its job is to cover the different structures, bones, muscles, nerves, and vessels, and protect them. So its, its job is to actually absorb contraction. Uh, there, if the body, say for example, if you start to fall, the fascia that surrounds the different muscles and tissues will contract right before you, you fall in order to support the muscles and contain those muscles. So the difference being that the deeper fascia is protective, it's contracting and it holds everything together. Whereas the superficial is more of a connection. So it connects the different layers together. Um, also deep fascia has receptors that signal the sensation of pain, right? You land hard when you fall and the body absorbs that shock, it feels that sensation, sends it to the brain to signal the brain that something is occurring in that particular area. And then the brain can respond accordingly. And then deep, deep, deep into the pockets or the cavities of our body, we have the visceral and the parietal fascia. And again, these are more loose, connective, ir irregular tissue that's that has that fat and that liquid hyaluronic acid in it. And its job is to surround and protect the internal organs. The visceral fascia surrounds the organs and the abdominal cavity, the lungs and the heart, whereas the parietal fascia lines the wall area of the pelvis. Now what's interesting and what's most relevant for the conversation that we're having today is the relationship between what we're calling myofascial slings. So the myofascial slings are different uh, planes 
that work together to create mobility and stability. So they are dense bands, as you can see, the superficial front sling, the superficial back sling, the lateral swing, the spiral, and the deep front swing. They're bands that run from the back to the front of the body, shoulder to the contralateral hip. And their job is to play an in integral role in coordinating control coordination and control, movement sequencing, and the integration or the kinetic movement that involves the transfer of force from the upper to the lower aspects of the body and extremities. So think of them as the slings that support and allow movement of the body. What's interesting for us is these slings are, are directly related to what we call our Jing Jin or sinew channels. These are not the Jing Lo, these are the sinew or muscle channels that are described separately from the Jing Lo. So the Jing Jin channels incorporate the sinew channels, the channel sinews, the muscle meridians, and the muscle conduits or tendon or muscular meridians. They are found in the Suen, in the Suen chapter 43. It says that Wei or defensive Qi is formed from food or drink. It cannot travel within the vessels, but flows between the skin and the muscles. It circulates through the chest and remains outside of the channels and vessels. Now, Machiocha then takes this information and combines it with the information that's found in chapter 13 of the Ling Shu. He says that the connective tissue of the limbs is either muscle or sinew in Chinese medicine. Fascia in limbs, sinews, or muscles are both called jin. Therefore, muscle jin is the muscle channels inclusive of fascia, cartilage, tendon, and ligaments. And then he says that they're discussed in chapter 13 of the Ling Shu called jing jin, channel-like muscles or muscles of the channels. And then in the Ling Shu in chapter 13, the reference that he's referring to is the statement that the pathology of sinews cause pain, tightness, and flaccidity, and even impairs movement. So again, there's this correlation of this band that we call Jing Jin that is specific to movement and the coordination of muscle and tendon uh, movement within the body. And also founded by the research of Helen Langevin at the University of Vermont, she suggests an overlap between fascia and the traditional Chinese medicine concept of channels or collaterals. Now, she kind of combines Jing Jin and Jing Lo, because what she's saying is that she and her colleagues notice that the insertion and the attachments of the muscles and fascia create cleavages or lines that pull like the grain of, uh, in wood. And then she says that the, there are many acupuncture points that lie directly over that area in these fascial cleavages where the sheets of fascia diverge to separate, surround, and support the muscle bundle, similar to the deeper fascia that we've been referring to. And then according to Langevin, the yang qi is said to flow in those spaces between the organs, the bones, and the flesh. Now, what's fascinating is we, as our, and when we think of our Jing Jin channels, we have 12 channels, six pair channels, the Tai Yang Sinew, the Yang Ming Sinew, the Yang Xiao, Tai Yin, Xiao Yin, and Zhui Yin Sinew channels. And if you look at the trajectory of those channels, they're very similar to the fascial slings. So you can see them kind of in, in this images, uh, the similarities between them. But then if you look at this image, you can actually see the direct correlation between the specifics of the slings and the superficial lines of the um, sinew channels. So you see the superficial back and the urinary bladder channels are very similar. The front line and the stomach channel are, have overlapping similarities. And then the deep back arm line, the small is correlates with the small intestine sinew channel and the heart sinew channel. The superficial back arm line corresponds with the triple burner sinew and the large intestine sinew channel. And then if you look in the, the, the similarities between the lateral line and the gallbladder sinew channel, they're almost uh, identical. And then again, through the deep front line, 
we see overlapping correspondences between the liver sinew channel, the kidney sinew channel, the spleen sinew and the spleen sinew channel. And then again, lastly, the deep front arm line corresponds to the lung sinew channel and the heart sinew channel and the superficial front arm line is very similar to the pericardium sinew channel. So you can see that the planes of these channels very much overlap with one another. So when we compare the similarities between Jingjin and fascia, we see that from a conceptual and anatomical and functional perspective, there are certain parallels between the Jingjin and Chinese medicine and Western medicine. Um, in that the myofascial system can be observed in their roles as connective tissue networks that support, connect, and influence body movement. And even though they're described differently in our medical frameworks, they both recognize the importance of these pathways in, in maintaining health, um, both in terms of structural support. In Chinese medicine, we see them in terms of our our support movement and stability of the skeletal system. We see in Chinese medicine, the concept of pain and dysfunction are attributed to our blockages or imbalances in the flow of qi and blood. And we know that from our Jingjin sinew meridians, they are thought to be responsible for the smooth circulation of vital energies. And when there's an obstruction in the sinew channels, it can lead to musculoskeletal problems pain and a decreased ability to provide support to the body. And then we see the very similarities in Western medicine and Western anatomy, the same recognition of connective tissue that envelops and connects the muscles, the organs, the blood vessels, the nerves, and other structures. And that same three-dimensional network or support system throughout the body. And similarly, when there are obstructions or disturbances in the myofascial slings and the fascial system, it leads to musculoskeletal problems, pain, and a decreased ability to provide structural support. We also see that similarity in the ability of the Jing Jin and, and fascia and the, uh, to movement and mechanical transmission. So the Jing Jin acts as a conduit for a smooth flow of qi and blood throughout the body and supporting that movement. Whereas in Western medicine, it's the fascia that facilitates that smooth mood and gliding action between the adjacent structures. We see there's this interconnection. So we see in Chinese medicine, we understand that connection between everything, that continuous flow of qi and blood through the meridians and the vessels that are believed to nourish and support the organs and the tissues. And we also understand that blockages or imbalances in this flow lead to health problems. And then we also correlate that interconnection integration by understanding the, commotion, the emotional component of um, both pain, but also trauma into those uh, Jing Jin affecting the specific organ system separately. Um, although the Jing Jin does not necessarily refer to the organ systems, we know that there is an interconnection and integration in all of the body parts um, with the deeper senses of emotion in our, in our being. And then in Western medicine, um, they think of this interconnection and integration more in terms of movement, but again, we all recognize the emotional component of it. And then there's the understanding of the parallel between gin and fascia in terms of pain and the perception of, of pain. So we know from our functional MRI studies in that acupuncture's ability to influence the brain's activity in regions associated with pain perception, motor control, and mood regulation. And we know that acupuncture has been shown to activate the release of pain relieving endorphins by modulating these pain perceptions. We can, with acupuncture, we can reduce pain, improve mobility and ease emotional related discomfort. The same with in Western medicine, they may not use acupuncture, but there is that innate understanding that fascia contains sensory receptors, propria receptors and neuro receptors, at which contribute to the somatic sensation and proprioception. 
in our Chinese medicine, we see pain in terms of B syndrome. And we and our, from our understanding of the gene gym, they're not, although they're not related to individual organs, uh, we do know that the pain itself is what flows through the concept of pain or what we call B or painful obstruction syndrome, pain, soreness, numbness of the muscles and ten tendons and joints rose, runs through our Jing Jin. And we know that acupuncture improves and accelerates that flow of qi and blood within the Jing Jin to alleviate B syndrome and restore proper function. Now, Although the Jing Jin uh, does not have acupuncture points, those acupuncture points lie along the Jing Lo. But we know that the Jing Jin and the Jing Lo run in parallel. Uh, so we use the Jing Lo points in order to affect the Jing Jin meridians. And classical treatment strategies will include primarily, we think of the gene well points. Um, we also know that there are those four meeting points that are organized the channels in, regardless of their being an arm, a leg, or, or uh, upper or lower. Uh, we know that the CV3 is for the three leg yin channels small intestine 18 for the three young channels, stomach eight or GB13, depending upon the source for the three young channels of the arm and gallbladder 22 for the three yin, yin channels of the arm. And we also have realized that those anatomical locations of these specific points are similar to the histological nodes and convergent points of different myofascial planes. So there's a, another correlation there. Um, in terms of treatment, we generally use the ashi points, or those are the points when you palpate someone and they go, ah, <laughs> those are our ashi points. Uh, trigger points, those are those discrete local hyper irritable spots along a band. So although the pain may be felt in a different area, it's the that one trigger point is kind of the referral pain that accompanies this musculoskeletal uh, discomfort or we use motor points and motor points are the site where the motor nerve first pierces the muscle belly it's also known as the MEP or the motor nerve entry point and uh, so those are so those are the points that are very a little bit larger in diameter they carry a greater quantity of motor and sensory sensations and uh, so those are great points for treatment as well. Other forms of treatment include cupping or gua sha. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, here's a case study, and this is a hypothetical case study of a 47-year-old male patient presenting with a three-year history of plantar fasciitis. Um, he complains of excruciating, sharp, burning pain on the soles of his feet that would come and go. The right foot was worse than the left and the right hamstring, lower back, soleus and medial head of the gastric nemus were very tight. And then that pain and upon palpation extended to the medial head of the area of the kidney six area. Now, the patient said that he was not aware of any other physical or digestive disturbances, but upon palpation, uh, what we find is that are, are looking at his tongue and pulse, that his pulse was wiry and deep in the both proximal positions and tongue pale with red tips. So what does that tell us? It tells us that although we are treating the pain through the Jing Jin, and in our situation, given this case study, this is the Tai Yang Sinew Channel, or what we call the superficial back line from a Western medical perspective, but we also can tell that from his tongue and from his pulse that he has a little bit of underlying kidney deficiency. So we're going to treat the, the stagnation in the bladder meridian of the Tai Yang sinew channel. That's our primary treatment. We may support the kidney chi deficiency because as Chinese medicine practitioners, we're always looking for that underlying root cause 
But the primary treatment is the stagnation and the Taiyang sinew channel. The treatment uh, is to resolve that stagnation in the bladder meridian of the Taiyang channel. And then, I'll, and then to the secondarily, we're going to nourish kidney chi and chi and blood of the kidneys. Uh, so these are points that we might use uh, that would support both the Taiyang sinew channel treatment and then supporting the underlying kidney deficiency. And from a Western perspective, what they were going to do is a very similar thing. So if you see a lot of these points, uh, bladder 40, 60, 56, 57, 67, 37, all are along the bladder meridian. And then we are supporting the underlying systems with kidney six, liver three, and spleen six. But as a Western medical practitioner treating the, the back line, what I would do is use trigger points or different types of treatments to pressure with pressure to release the, that medial gastric mean muscle. So the patient gets treated, he comes back a week later reporting that a significant reduction and there's a significant reduction in his pain along the undersole area, um, but he still has some tight calves and a little bit of tightness in the right hip, which would make sense by looking at both the back sling and the sinew channel. <clears throat> so the next two treatments, we're going to incorporate the following points, gallbladder 20. 29, 34, and these are designed to release the tightness around the hips. Again, we're treating that sling or that sinew channel. And then after three treatments, his musculoskeletal problems significantly improved and he was able to main, remain pain-free by regular home care treatment. And then if he were to go for physical therapy or a Western treatment, they would do a similar thing. They would treat continue to treat that medial gastric nemus area with including the anterolateral zone of the leg and the pelvis so you see the similarity there uh, with us treating the channels and then in western medical treatments the sling so there's a lot of overlap here and again going back to the similarities of who we are both from east and west and the importance of understanding both the Eastern and Western, I, I do believe that we're in the right time right now to be able to bring the East and Western medicine together and to make a huge difference and improve the health of our patients by offering a lot more opportunity and um, options. So thank you so much for today's presentation. Thank you to the American Acupuncture Council for allowing me to be here. It's always a pleasure and uh, have a wonderful day and take care of those slings. All righty, take care, bye.